message of the Bible is an ancient one. It's not changed in thousands of years. The good news that Jesus taught was good news which had already been taught even in the Old Testament times. And King David spoke about a happiness that transcended this life's circumstance. What is real happiness? You could say that a true happiness, a genuine happiness, is a happiness which goes beyond circumstances, beyond the ups and downs of this life, a happiness that cannot be taken away from you. David spoke about that happiness in Psalm 32, and he talked about a man who was blessed, truly happy. Many people look for happiness in wine, women, or song, or in money and all that this world has to offer them, and yet David spoke about a happiness that comes through having your sins forgiven. Listen to these words, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Blessed or truly happy is that word which describes a happiness which can never be taken from you. Your health, if your happiness is bound up in your health, will eventually fail. Finances, eventually, uh, even for the, the, the wealthiest in this world, have to be given up. They cannot be taken with you. And they cannot buy you the things which matter most. Everyone knows that. The Beatles themselves saying that money can't buy you love. But true happiness goes beyond even love, because a man who's alone can be truly happy if he knows a relationship with the one who created him. Ultimately, many people have said that we're created with a, uh, a void in us that can only be filled by our Creator. God has made us for a relationship with Himself, and um, that should be self-evident, and yet we're living in an age which has sought after happiness, sought after pleasure, really, in every other source. The reality is, is obvious to anyone who's watching is that pleasure has left people empty. And only God can fill that emptiness. But the reality also is that a relationship with God can only be found when one is restored into a relationship with God which has already been broken. All of us are born sinners, born in a state where we have offended the God who made us. And the good news of the Bible is that that relationship is possible to be restored. It's possible to be brought back into a relationship with God. David, speaking a thousand years before Christ ever set foot on the, this world, David spoke and he, he said these words, blessed, happy, truly happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. There are two words that describe the problem between us and God. Transgression, that's uh, a word that's easy for us to understand. It's from a Latin word, trans, meaning across, and gressus, meaning to step. Transgress, to step across. To step across what? To step across the line that God has made. God has drawn a line in the sand. He said, you can go this far, but no further. God says, you can tell the truth, but you may not lie. No lie. The reality is that all of us have known about that line. We, we know that it's wrong to lie. And yet at times like a disobedient child whose parents say you can go this far but no further, we'll walk up to the line and we'll step across it and look at our heavenly parent and say as it were, what are you going to do about it? Well God is serious about rebellion. And rebellion is something which spoils, which ruins our relationship with our Creator. You cannot have a, a happy, uh, blessed relationship with someone who you are shaking your fist at and saying, no, I will not do what you tell me to do, and I will do what you tell me not to do. And the second word that describes our problem here is the word sin. Sin is a word which uh, in the Hebrew language speaks about falling short. It's the, it's the word which would mean to miss the mark. An arrow is 
fire, but it, it never quite hits the target. God has said, this is his standard. Perfection is his standard. And yet every time we draw our moral bow and take aim and fire off our moral arrows, we always fall short of God's standard of perfection. That's the word sin. None of us meet even our own standards. We, we say that uh, to uh, be faithful to one's spouse or to be uh, loving to your neighbor would be a good thing. And we, we set a standard of behavior which, if the truth were told, every single one of us has broken at one level or another. None of us manage to live up to the standards that we set, let alone the standards that God has set in His holy world. That's just two out of three terms that describe the problem between us and God. And the third one is even more disturbing. It's the word iniquity, an ancient word, but a Hebrew word that describes an inner bentness, an inner perversity, a twistedness. But there's something actually wrong with us. When I was a, a young child, I took great offense at the boy next door taking our cat and taking certain amount of delight in throwing our little cat into his pot. We all react in, a, in horror when we see people delight in something which is cruel. There's a, a twistedness, there's a perversity about a human being who knows what is right to do taking pleasure in something which is obviously wrong. And yet, the tragedy is that at one level or another, every single one of us takes pleasure in things that we know are evil. That taken to its logical conclusion describes an inner perversity, an inner condition which the Bible calls iniquity, a bentness, a twistedness inside, which God is righteously angry with us for. It's not the way He designed us. He designed us to be just straight, just the way we were supposed to be, and yet there's something crooked inside. Transgression, rebellion, sin, failure, iniquity, perversity. Three words that describe for us the problem which has estranged us from our Creator. But then in this ancient psalm, Psalm 32, here are three concepts which describe the root back. And David starts off with this wonderful term, happy, blessed. Blessed is the one whose transgression, whose rebellion is forgiven. And the Hebrew word there, forgiven, is the word nasar, it's the word which means to lift up and carry away. It's a, an ancient term that was used, it's the very same term was used of uh, a ceremony which was carried out once a year in the Hebrew nation on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The high priest would come and confess the sins of all the people and place his hands on a goat and he would, the Bible said, the Bible says he would lay on, he would put on the goat the transgressions of all the people. And then this one goat would be released, would be led out into the wilderness, into a faraway place where there was no water, and released in the wilderness to suffer and to die there by itself. The word Nassar is used of the goat carrying away on itself the transgressions, the iniquities, the sins of the people. And the picture is so wonderful. How wonderful would it be for you to know that all your rebellion, all the times that you had deliberately stepped over the line that God has drawn in the sand, how wonderful would it be for you to know that those who had been lifted off you and placed on another and carried away. When the New Testament picks up that exact same picture with the, the story of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says about Jesus that he himself bore or carried our sins in his body on the tree. 